It's an honor to be here for this event and to share some insights on Mary as the mother of God and a bridge to unity. Unity has unfortunately eluded Christian communities from the apostolic era until today, and the causes of division are numerous and complex. For Catholic and Orthodox Christians, the causes of division are well known. We disagree on several issues, including the procession of the Holy Spirit or filioque, how the Holy Spirit consecrates the Eucharist, the issue of clerical celibacy, and most importantly, papal primacy and authority in the church. Our disagreements often carry a spirit of divisive intensity and seem insurmountable to the point where many Catholics and Orthodox agree on one point only. It is preferable to remain divided. The reality of our current situation, however, clearly violates the Gospel Commission as Jesus sends his disciples to baptize all nations. St. Paul confirms the Gospel Commission in a passage from his letter to the Galatians, still sung as the entrance hymn on some Orthodox feasts. Quote, For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free person. There is not male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus." End quote. The church has always emphasized Jesus as the person who unites all peoples, especially those who have the gift of the Holy Spirit. Hilda Greif, a Marian scholar, believed that the Jesus we meet in the Gospels differs from the Jesus defined by the ecumenical councils. The carpenter who taught with authority and in the common language of the people, who continuously amazed his disciples and the crowds who gathered to hear him, became a supremely divine being, the divine image and word, homoousios, with his father. These new conciliar images of Jesus attempted to protect the fullness of his two natures, but for many people they also restricted access to him as the mediator who is like us in every way, as described in Hebrews 4.15. Jesus' equality with his father became so accentuated that theologians adopted an apophatic approach to speaking of him, meaning we can only say what his nature is not. He is ineffable, beyond understanding, not created. A Jesus whom we cannot understand is not a Jesus who is very present to us. With Jesus more distant than ever, a gap emerged for Christians. To whom could people turn with their troubles and fears? With whom could people entrust their prayers, requests, demands, and pleas? For many centuries, it was one's favorite local saint, usually a martyr who reminded one of Jesus. But eventually Mary, projecting a caring, protective, nurturing persona, filled this gap in the devotional life of Christians. She provided access to the divine Christ God and gave the common people hope when God seemed distant. Coincidentally, Mary's role and title were also recast as the ecumenical councils defined Jesus' identity in person and nature. In 431, the Council of Ephesus defined Mary as Theotokos, she who gave birth to God, a deeply impersonal title illustrating the unity of Christ's two natures, wherein the human agent of the mystery is Mary. By the fifth century, feasts remembering Mary's life began to populate the church's liturgical calendar. Perhaps more importantly, civil authorities, imperial and church leaders, and faithful Christians increasingly turned to her as their hope and salvation. Since Orthodox turned to Mary for help, what is it that we believe she has done for us? We can learn a great deal from our liturgy, since liturgy, the Lex Orandi, or Law of Worship, is the primary source for all theology, and thus our best source for understanding how Orthodox remember and honor Mary. 
I will present select components from two Orthodox feasts honoring Mary. Her birth, celebrated on September 8, and her falling asleep, Dormition, celebrated on August 15th. I will also draw from cultural ideas about Mary to provide a more complete picture of the way Orthodox embrace her. In Orthodox liturgy, the birth of Mary is celebrated much like other major feasts in the liturgical year. It is a great feast, like a Catholic solemnity, <clears throat> excuse me, ranked alongside the dominical feasts of the Lord. In Orthodox liturgical practice, chanted hymns occupy a privileged and prominent role. Hymns are the vehicle for the best patristic preaching. They synthesize ideas from the sermons of the Holy Fathers, and in a poetic fashion, they explain meaning, establish moral prerogatives, prick our consciences, and glorify God. Several hymns from the Feast of Mary's birth contain surprising ideas, and here are two examples. The first hymn from the birth of Mary addresses Adam and Eve. Quote, Rejoice with us today, for if by your transgression you close the gate of paradise to those of old, we have now been given a glorious fruit, Mary, the child of God, who opens its entrance to all. She is the restoration of Adam and the recalling of Eve, the fountain of incorruption and the release from corruption. Through her we have been made godlike and delivered from death." End quote. Think about these claims for a moment. Mary reopens paradise, closed by humanity's fall in the second Genesis creation story. Mary delivers Christians from death. The second hymn mentions Adam's restoration and Eve's recalling. One can imagine a typical orthodox icon of the resurrection where Jesus defeats death, descends into Hades, and destroys it by his cross, depicted by his raising with his outstretched arm of Adam and sometimes Eve. The only difference is that this hymn credits Mary with this victory. In this case, Jesus is not included as part of the picture. Mary has accomplished all the work herself, and it is a work of salvation. If we attempt to frame Mary's birth in the larger picture of salvation history, it is as if salvation begins with Mary. Thus, the Lex Arandi, the law of worship of Mary's birth, celebrated as the first major feast of the Orthodox liturgical year, confirms that salvation does begin with her. Mary's death, which is called falling asleep in Greek, is the last major feast of the liturgical year, celebrated on August 15th, and is similar in its solemnity to the Catholic celebration of the Assumption. I am happy that my colleague, Father Llewellyn, will speak about the image of Mary projected by the Catholic celebration of the Assumption, and will give us a good point of departure for comparison. The Orthodox Liturgy of the Dormition contains several special components. First, a 14-day fasting period precedes this feast. Second, in its fullest form, it is a striking imitation of Orthodox Holy Week, including a burial procession and vigil with an ornate burial sheet made of fine cloth of Mary in her death which we call in our tradition an epitaphios, or plaschenitsa. For Orthodox, Mary's death is a summer Pascha, a summer Easter. The icon of the Dormition feast shows Jesus himself appearing at her grave to escort her to heaven. According to the hymnography, Mary's tomb was empty on the third day, and she ascended to heaven. The Orthodox liturgy makes a strong statement about Mary's encounter with death. The following hymn, sung at Matins, in a canon attributed to St. John of Damascus, attests to Mary's victory over death. Quote, O pure virgin, you have won the honor of victory over nature by bringing forth God. Yet, like your son and creator, you have submitted 
to the laws of nature in a manner above nature. Therefore, dying, you have risen to live eternally with your son." End quote. Similarly, the burial rite celebrated at Mary's tomb confirms her death as having many of the same characteristics as Christ's. Here is a sampling of hymns from the burial rite. Quote, Even in the tomb, O virgin, your honorable body did not see corruption, but you have passed with your body from earth to heaven. Your son, the God of glory, O pure one, has received you as his mother and has seated you at his right hand." End quote. The Orthodox believe that Mary has entered into Christ's Pascha, that she has risen body and soul to be at Christ's right hand in heaven. Mary has been given the highest of all honors to receive the promise of the resurrection. Her ascension to heaven is an enthronement. Here is just a small sampling of additional titles given to Mary in the Orthodox Dormition Hymns of Vespers. She is the Throne of the King, Holy Place of God, Palace of the King, Ark of Holiness, Gate of God, Bride of God, and Queen. Many of these titles evoke images of Mary as Jesus' mother since she contained God in her womb. But the use of titles such as bride and queen bestow, bestow royalty upon her and suggest that she has a unique intimacy with God and also rules or perhaps co-rules over a group of people. Thus, the Orthodox do not stop at honoring Mary as a contributor to God's salvation of humankind. The Lexerandi of the Dormition Feast explicates salvation as ongoing with Mary now, who continues to rule. The image of Mary as the mother who rules over and protects the Orthodox people is rooted in history. Constantinople adopted Mary as their patron as early as the 5th century. Constantinopolitans endured numerous woes, including invasion, earthquakes, and plagues. The struggle of war, disaster, and disease quickly paved a path for an intercessor, and the imperial authorities promoted devotion to Mary, placing an icon of Mary on the gates of, her, of the city with her image also appearing on coinage and bronze weights. The Constantinopolitans carried her icon into battle with the expectation that she would protect them. Ironically, one such icon was taken from Constantinople by the invading crusaders in 1204, and the icon still resides in Venice. So while Mary did not protect the Orthodox Greeks and her image went into captivity, the Venetian captors adopted her as their protector. This is a reverse instance of a religious transfer of power, the opposite of what was common to the ancient Near East when the conquerors forced the defeated people to adopt the victorious god. In this instance, the conquerors adopted the defeated protector as their patron. The defeat to the Crusaders increased the divisions between Western and Eastern Christians, a hurt felt to this day. The hurt is so deep that Pope John Paul II apologized on behalf of all Catholics to the Greek people for the Crusade in 1204 when he visited Greece in 2001. If anything, Mary's involvement in the Crusade served to further divide East and West even if she was an involuntary participant. The humiliating defeat at the hands of the Crusaders did not stop the Orthodox from viewing Mary as their protector. Mary also has several military titles. The celebrated Akathistos hymn of the 6th century, perhaps as early as the 4th, contains numerous military images of Mary. The 12th Stasis contains the following verses, quote, Rejoice, O you through whom the trophies are raised. Rejoice, O you through whom the enemies are routed. End quote. 